everybody. Thanks for joining me here and thanks for checking out my podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and click the notification bell for new episodes. You can also find Shine Without Shame on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Oh, that's interesting. That that equates good self-esteem when you That's that's where you get yourself. Yeah, that's how you maintain your self-esteem. When you but when you're that's when you're putting someone else down. When you putting other people down maintain self-esteem. That's interesting. That's not what I thought self-esteem was about. I I didn't realize it was in the context of comparison or putting Well, people down. will say that authentic self-esteem is a trait, it's robust, it's stable, but it's not. It 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 fluctuates. Mm-hmm. And but like there'll be that overarching uh, you know, the overarching latent factor of self-esteem is pretty stable. But there are day-to-day hits on your self-esteem. There are minute-to-minute hits on your self-esteem. And these this is dealt processed with very quickly for the most time, for the most part, but sometimes it's processed a little bit in, in a more sinister way. Now, there are other ways you can repair your self-esteem and maintain your health self-esteem. We're just focusing on this topic. So I don't want everybody to think that this is the only way that this is done. But the kids in our study, the adolescent girls in our studies who had the better self-esteem put down their source of threat. Hmm, okay. Okay. And, and so the study, you said it was 1100. Uh, no. So this is another study of uh, 700 um, adolescents that we've been following from the time they were 10 until they're now 26. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And so what are the qualities, I mean, we're talking about self-esteem, but what are the other qualities that allow someone to, to thrive, to, I suppose, you know, be, if if there's, if there is such a thing as healthy competition, I think there is because sports is a, is a good example. Um, But what are the qualities that you see that are necessary for a person and maybe especially females, but, but anybody to have a healthy sense of self to have uh you know a sense of worth um, yeah, to, no, to, to I thrive what you're to mm-hmm. thrive in the world without necessarily having to you know go to battle so there are two types of competitiveness and we haven't made that distinction so there's the personal development competitiveness and there's the hyper competitiveness so i've been focusing on hyper competitiveness where um zero sum game um If I win, you lose. If you win, I lose, that sort of thing. But there's also personal development competitiveness. And um, there are people in the world who have this this type of personality where the competition um, makes them feel like they need to, in a sense, um, it influences them in in a positive way. So they want to be better than they were before, but they're competing with themselves. So instead of um, I have to beat everybody to feel good about myself, I just need to be better than I, what I was before. So if I notice that you're really good at X, whatever X is, and it's something that I value, um, instead of becoming jealous and putting you down or internalizing that jealousy, I use that to motivate myself to become even better at X. And those people exist too. And that also maintains your self-esteem. In our studies, what we find is that it's more likely they're going to be hyper-competitive than that personal development competitiveness. But this is where I think, and this is the work that I do in sport a lot, is trying to get individuals to be more on that personal development competitiveness than the hyper-competitiveness. So instead of focusing on how Sarah is a better soccer player than you, focus on what I have to do to become a better soccer player. And then I may then overtake Sarah on that starting position. I gotcha. Yes. And do you find that your, do you have a a goal or an interest in promoting more of that personal, uh, inter- like personal competition and development, or are you just simply, you know, doing the research and observing and, you know, sharing those results or, or, or is, is part of your work also to promote uh, a specific 
mm, kind of uh, competition, whether it's the hyper or the personal development part of it. Like that's my that's my life's work, really. So like when I do my outreach work, so I do a lot of work in sport in Canada mm -hmm. um, and I work with elite athletes across different sectors, sports sectors. Um, I work with coaches and I always emphasize this difference between hyper competitiveness and personal development competitiveness. And I talk about, uh, in a sense, it's like uh, using cognitive behavioral therapy to get towards this personal development. So, you know, and it takes a lot of work because I would think so, you know, I mean, I would say, uh, you know, there's another component I just need to say competitiveness and the, and, and how it manifests also has to do with what you value. So uh, I don't know, Tiffany, did you ever play soccer? Were you ever a soccer player? No, I was a basketball player though, in terms of okay. team sports. So if we were doing um, penalty shot practices, you and I decided to go out and kick the ball around um, that, that domain really matters to me. Being a good soccer player is, is a domain that's important to me, but it won't be important to you because it's not your sport. So if you miss the net 80% of the time, you're not going to be bothered by it. It's not going to elicit this reaction. You're not going to feel competitive with me because you're going to be like, ah, I'm going to give it to her. This is something she's good at, right? I don't care. Um, same with if we were doing basketball, but if we were both soccer players and we were out there, then we would get competitive. So I just wanted to make that distinction that what, so the self-esteem that's like folded into the comparison, social comparisons that leads to competitiveness, that sort of thing also has to do with what you value. So if you value being a beautiful woman, if you value being a smart woman, if you value being a good mother, that those are the domains you're competing in. You're not going to compete in domains that you don't care about right like it just like i'll oh, let them have it i don't i don't care right um so anyhow so that said um exactly i'm i'm getting i'm trying to get athletes to think differently about this and get coaches to think differently because they'll be more resilient and they'll be uh there'll be less burnout there'll be fewer mental health issues that sort of thing so yeah this is something i'm quite passionate about that's exciting i'm 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 glad to know that, you know, that you're able to then take the work, your, take your work and extrapolate it out into the world and, and mm -hmm. have an influence, you know, that's, that is a, a really cool passion. And is it something, I know you said it takes a lot of work, but is it something that people understand? Like, do they, are they able to grab onto? They get it right away. They get it right away because even, you know, back to what we value and how that affects are like the manifestation of that comparison, um, people get that right away. So again, like if you don't care about soccer, you're not going to care about a competition we're going to get involved in. And so, but if you care a lot about it, it's going to be hard to rein in that hyper competitiveness side, especially when let's say we're, we're in a competition and only one of us is going to go through and represent Canada or the United States. So how how do I manage my emotions when the resources are so scarce? And it and it means so much to me. Right. And do you do any of this outreach with the younger people? Yeah, I do it with young athletes. Athletes. Yeah. So I primarily this stuff I do with athletes. Okay. But it's really interesting because like athletes in a sense are like when you think about like all traits reside along a continuum. So, you know, the bell curve, you can kind of think about there's going to be some that have it quite exaggerated and others that barely have it. So um, I'm at that end of that, that far end of the curve on competitiveness. Like mm -hmm. these individuals are very competitive and they wear the, their heart on their sleeve. So in a way it's really raw and it's easy to see. And so I think it makes me a good scientist too. Right. That makes sense. Yes. Well, and I'm curious, are there any, when it comes to the bullying aspect, just going back to where we started with uh, young people and especially, I think it's girls that you focused on, if I understand uh, how, what is it that, what is it that needs to be a part of an environment to help 
quell some of the bullying? I mean, I, I know that's a very individual sort of experience, a personal experience, but I, I imagine the environment contributes to bullying. hundred like percent. Schools or yes. wherever. And I'm just, I, I don't know. Uh, we all know about bullying. This has become such a, a hot topic uh, and mm-hmm. we understand because of, you know, our kids and, and it, it's a real thing, you know, we don't have to, uh, most of us don't have to go out and do any research. We know it happens. We see it, but I'm curious from your standpoint, how do the environments that kids are in uh, contribute to bullying and, and what can be done to start to uh, minimize this or, or at least address mm-hmm. it more head on? One of the things that I think we've done a really poor job at and why our reductions of bullying rates are so poor is that we focused on a subset of kids who bully others that don't represent the typical bully. So we've kind of, in a sense, we hold the stereotype of who bullies others, like Nelson from The Simpsons. But most kids who bully others wield power. So, um, and some programs, some anti-bullying programs are now appreciating this and are working in this power structure into their prevention and intervention efforts. That said, it's interesting because the kids who are most impervious to our best attempts at reducing bullying are the high status bullies. And why would they give up their source of power, right? I mean, it feels good to be at the top of that hierarchy. Um, There's a lot of privilege that comes with it. Um, So we need to rethink this and we need to be thinking about this power structure and the power dynamics a lot more. Bullying is a systematic abuse of power. One of the things I'd like to see us do earlier in our anti-bullying programs is to talk about power and the corrupting influence of power and how to be good when you hold power. So you could think about, you can have implicit power that is achieved by having assets and competencies that the peer group values. Um, I always talk about Barack Obama to me is a great example of implicit power. You can also have explicit power, which is achieved by um, eliciting fear and submission. So being an autocratic leader and that sort of thing. And so I always thought, think about Donald Trump as being a great example of explicit power. And then those who bully others are kind of like this melange of implicit and explicit power. So they have assets and competencies that the peer group values that tend to be good looking, um, athletic, those sorts of things um, come from wealthier families. But then they also have that autocratic side where they're eliciting fear and compliance and submission. Um, And so if we had kids understand that with power comes enormous responsibility, but we don't ever have those conversations about power with kids. And so what we see is that um, in our studies, and that's been replicated, we we found that kids who were bullied became bullies over time. Because if you can't beat them, you might as well join them. It feels better to bully others than to be bullied. That's a problem, right? Mm-hmm. And and it, But it makes sense because what they see around them are examples of using aggressive means in a way that works. So it'll be interesting to see like, um, a good example, again, the Super Bowl yesterday with Travis Kelsey going after his coach in such a visible way and problematic way. Um, you know, he kind of represents that popular kid in the high school, good looking, married to or dating the, the, the most popular girl in the school. They have everything. Everybody's interested in them. And then he misbehaved in a really visible way. And what what are the implications of that? I suspect there aren't going to be be many. And so what message does that then send back to kids that you can bully with impunity, you can misbehave and you won't, um, there'll be no sanctions if you hold um, certain characteristics. So we have a lot of work to do. Yes. Okay. Yes. And I'm wondering in terms of I know that you're you're writing a book or you're you're going to be releasing a book soon about a lot of these uh, ideas and uh, and also this you know offering solutions. When you think about parents or teachers or coaches mm-hmm. uh, or just you know community members thinking of you know 
people in 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 groups um from the adult perspective what are the what words of wisdom or insights or or guidance would you want people to to consider and to you know to think about applying in the, in their lives on whatever level that is in terms I, of yeah this this topic of competition and and power and bullying it comes back to that honest discussion i mean it's hard to repair something that you're not willing to acknowledge acknowledge so um one of the things that i've noticed in my career and i've done also frontline work um so it's not just research you know i also have an applied part to this um is that a lot of times when parents now are brought into um or it's brought to their attention that their kid is bullying others they um deny that that's even plausible like right away it's like and they in a sense engage in bullying behavior there's no way my sweet little emily could ever do that which is such because Emily is not a saint at home. Like they know who this kid is and they know that their daughter's temperament. So what I would love for us to recognize and for parents to start accepting is that aggression is part of the human condition, that kids are just learning about this, um, you know, learning how to manage their emotions, learning how to manage um, their jealousy, their social comparisons, how to uh, wield their power appropriately and so we, if we shut down the conversation and we support their view, their viewpoint, which is erroneous, then we're not doing any favors for our kid or for society. So we have to have these tough conversations. We have to be open-minded and uh, it doesn't reflect poorly on you if your kid has bullied somebody else. It, what it reflects is human development. And so um, instead of being defensive, um, you know, be open-minded, listen to what the educators are telling you and, and work with your child to, to be better. And, but if you right away take their side and say, this is not plausible, um, then we're going to get nowhere. We're not going to be able to, to reduce this. And we already have a hard time reducing bullying. Have you ever uh, been aware of <laughs> like character development programs in schools and how that influences or reduces bullying? Is that something that exists that you're aware of? So some of the better programs deal with moral disengagement. And moral disengagement is a cognitive mechanism that we all use to make our egregious acts more palatable. So if I do something really crummy, um, because I don't think I'm a bad person, um, I need to repair that. And I use a variety of different strategies, cognitive strategies, but they all fall under this umbrella called moral disengagement. I may say that, well, you were being provocative, so you had it coming to you. I may diffuse my responsibility and say, well, I wasn't really, I was just watching. I wasn't really participating. I might um, make an advantageous comparison where I say, I just called you a name. It's not like I shoved you in the locker. All of these things to repair it. I'll use euphemistic labels saying like, I was just teasing you. I wasn't bullying you. So I kind of make myself feel right with what I've done. So we all do this. And again, back to self-esteem, like you maintain your self-esteem by, in a sense, you're gaslighting yourself the whole time. Like, I'm a good person. They had it coming to them, that sort of thing. So um, programs that address moral disengagement, because moral disengagement is attached to bullying, tend to have um, reductions in bullying behavior. So getting kids to be morally responsible and present and to and to not wiggle their way out of it. Because if you wiggle way, your way out of it by making all these excuses, you haven't done the work to not do it again. Okay. Yeah, that does require work. You're right. It and does. I think to start at a young age, you know, mm -hmm. learning the tools and the process or processes to to do that, that work is, is critical because when you become an adult, if you haven't done any of that work, Ooh, it's a lot harder. There, and you're blaming everybody else then. And, right? right. And there are, I would think the stakes would be higher possibly in certain circumstances. Exactly. Uh, so it does pay to address things at a younger age, even though it's uncomfortable. It's awkward to have these kinds of conversations. And like you said, I think for parents, it can be, it, it can be very difficult to be in that vulnerable place, you know, where your child may be, 
the cause of of uh you know of some some harm or pain and and it's like you said i think it's it's to frame it in the in the uh in the light of this is just part of development so let's mm-hmm. not <laughs> you don't have to you know sacrifice yourself uh, uh, but in terms of you know thinking that my child is perfect and can't and can never can never do wrong and and you know to to ignore that this is just part of of life but let's i think let's address what needs to be addressed now and hopefully it just makes life easier for mm-hmm. everybody so um i'll give you an example so i remember my daughter molly telling me about how in grade 6 this kid had done her wrong right so this girl had did x y and z and hearing it i you know you can't help but become emotionally involved right away i i had a visceral reaction to what i was hearing but I also do this for a living. So I also said to her, okay, so thanks for sharing. Um, like, how is she going to tell her mother the story? Like, what is her story going to be? How is she going to describe it? And so then when Molly explained how she thought the person would explain what had happened, I got a more fulsome idea of what had happened. And they were both um, inappropriate. Mm. So. Instead of like me taking it at face value that this kid had done her wrong and this kid needed to be punished, you know, I recognize that interactions are just that, interactions that have more than one person. And so their viewpoint needs to be considered. And and then in doing so, you could get closer to truth and closer to fixing this. That seems so useful and helpful. Thank you. Yes. Because it's true. Emotionally, you just become protective and defensive and that's natural. You want to protect your child. So it's, it's, I think the, the ultimate goal is for everyone to, you know, to grow and to learn. And, and Mm -hmm. this is, you have to get to truth or as much of the truth as you can in order to, to evolve. Yeah. It seems. So everybody has a, everyone has a role. Young people. We all do. Exactly. It's the reframing, like the reframing is really important, especially for parents. We act as prefrontal cortex for our kids where they're surrogate prefrontal cortex and they don't have the same ability to to interpret the the information. Um, They don't have the same background. Right. Like they're just they're they're just emerging as um, as children growing into adolescents, growing into adults. So we don't expect them to get it all right. But what we can do is we can reframe things so that they're getting closer to truth. Yes. That seems like a good, a good plan to me. Well, I, before we wrap up, I thought I would ask, do you have any, I don't know, any words of wisdom or insights or any final thoughts you want to share with people, people listening, or I'm sure from, a variety of backgrounds and and circumstances, but in in the context of competition and the idea that you know competition in and of itself isn't bad, but the idea that we want to we all want to thrive and thinking of kids and yeah. and everybody wants to thrive and be happy and I, I'd like to think people want to feel good about their lives and 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 how they're contributing to the world and. It, in terms of trying to, I guess, in my mind, promote, I want to promote kind of a higher, higher level of, mm-hmm. of behavior, as opposed to just thinking that it's about all or nothing or scarcity. Like what, what, what can people, maybe what can people think about or, or, or what can they take away in, in your final thoughts or words in terms of just, we all hopefully can can be happy and thrive and you know work through um our challenges from a place of hopefully emotional maturity or clarity mm-hmm. and insight when i i think i mean we're going to make social comparisons we all make social comparisons we want to see how we measure up i mean that's part of the human condition as well and so i think that when we make the social comparison and we start feeling yucky about it because when the social comparison doesn't favor us, um, then I think we need to take a step back and pause and not react immediately and, and think, can I use this to benefit me in a more positive way? 
can I get this to, uh, can I use this to, to motivate myself to work harder or to be um, more creative or whatever it's going to be, right? Instead of doing the lazy route. And the lazy route to me is um, attacking the source of jealousy, the source that's making you feel um, icky. Um, and then I think that coming, this comes full circle to your topic of shame. I mean, it does make you feel shame when you feel like you're not measuring up and you're, you don't matter or you're, you're not achieving as much. Um, and so that has to, we can, we can repair that. We can, we can do that cognitive reframing where again, we use it to our advantage instead of, um, you know, use it or repair it in a nefarious way. If that makes sense. Yes. Thank you so much. And I want to ask you a question, which I ask all my guests at the end. Uh, what is your, or which TV show would you recommend? It doesn't have to be your favorite, but which would you recommend new or old show and why? So it's interesting. I do a little bit of research on autism. About 30% of my research is autism. And I really like love on the spectrum. And but there's a there's some controversy about it because some people have argued that, well, you know, in a sense, we're um voyeurs of individuals who have autism spectrum disorder, uh, we're infanticizing them and the like. And yet the people who are in those shows themselves say, no, that's not at all how we feel. Um, you know, this is something we participated in that we wanted to do, and that has brought us um, pleasure. And and we appreciate the efforts that were put in to making this uh, a positive experience. So that said, I love Love on the Spectrum. Okay, I've heard of it. Yeah, you know, I haven't watched it. There's a an American version. It's it originated in Australia, and now there's two seasons of the American version, and it's fantastic. Okay, and it's 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 insightful. It sounds like into yes, I yes, I really appreciate it. That's cool. Okay, wonderful. I will add that to the list. <laughs> so you're lovely. I really enjoyed this. I you're so calm, um, in your presentation style. So I appreciated that a lot. Thank you. Oh, good. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time to to share your insights, talk about your research. I know you've talked about this a lot, but I, I appreciate you framing it, you know, within uh, the the topic of shame and and competition. Um, so thank you. It's been it's been insightful and and even inspiring for me because I I especially as you talk talked about how your uh, how you're applying this in other ways, you know, outside of your research and, mm -hmm. and the work you're doing with your coaching. That's, that's wonderful to hear. And, and it's just, uh, it's helpful to hear someone talk about, you know, taking something, taking a topic that they've studied and, and then applying it out in the real world and trying to make a difference. So thank you for that work you're doing. And, and reverse engineering it, I think is why my studies have replicated because you know there's a replication issue is because I see it and I see it over and over again and then I test out the phenomenon in the lab. That's cool. Yes, that I imagine that is so useful and that uh, that that means that you you really do care about this work. I know you called it your passion. Yeah, I love it. I love my job. <laughs> that comes through. That really comes through. Well, thank you again for being here for for taking the time and and giving your energy and for all the work you're doing and we'll look out for your your book you said that's coming out later this year yeah i'll keep you posted okay 